up, y'all? Welcome to the stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And what on the stack. Up? What? What? What is up? Oh, what Pete is, wants a little is... editorial time at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Pete, do your what's up section. Go for it. Hey, everybody, <laughs> what is up? <laughs> Why? Oh, that, I, okay. that is a fun <laughs> section. What a fun way to kick it off. You We're sound like Balky, of- Balky Bartokimus. <laughs> My We're- guy. We're going to talk about a bunch of comics that came out this very week. We're going to review them. We're going to talk about them. We're going to offer up our unfiltered opinions. We're going to kick it off with King in Black, number three from Marvel, written by Donnie Cates and art by Ryan Stegman. This issue, spoilers, Venom is dead. And what remains of the Marvel heroes are going right up against Null. That includes Venom's son. It also includes Thor, who has finally come back to take on Null. There's some brutal stuff that happens in this issue. Uh, we're almost through this event, I think, at this point. We're definitely, like, at the halfway yeah. point. Uh, what do you think about it so far? What do you think about this issue in particular? What I really like about this event is it has a unique structure. I feel like so many events are built around the idea of, like, uh, heroes having normal lives, problem emerges. Everything gets bad, heroes rally, they win. And right, in this, right. it was f- everything is bad immediately out of the gate. And then we're now we're seeing like something's getting worse. We're seeing little pops of different hero moments. Um, and in this issue, we get um, Thor popping, and uh, it's it's really good. I love the last page reveal. The art's fantastic in this issue. Um, and it's also funny how little Null, Null is just sort of hovering at the center of it, but we haven't seen a lot of Null doing stuff. Yeah, I mean, this issue he definitely mixes it up, though. I think uh, this is just a lot of fun, a uh, really uh, great kind of event. I've been really happy with the action in this. It keeps things get keep getting worse, but there's little glimmers of hope. Uh, I've been very much enjoying the over-the-top action action adventure and uh fun uh that they're having on this i i'm i'm this is just a really cool very badass shit going on here giant uh dragons and flaming monsters and the last page reveal is just fucking badass this might be the goop on the Chrysler building, but this is starting to remind me a lot of Inferno, the crossover from back in the day uh, where yeah. demons took over new york um uh, partially Wait, wait, wait. Was that Ghostbusters 2 reference with the, the ooze on the... What do we mean? 100% the absolutely not. Uh, okay. It was a reference to the X-Men crossover Inferno. Uh, ah. Which just had this like, very iconic thing of the Empire State Building being taken over by uh, the demons from Limbo and it just getting bigger and bigger over time and people being like, hey, that's weird. The Empire State Building's bigger than I remember it is. Uh This reminds me a lot of that, uh, but it also reminds me a lot of that because you have these disparate elements from these other miniseries and other things going on kind of starting to come together in this issue, different threads. Uh, Justin, you mentioned this a couple of issues back, but I think the one thing that um, one thing that Donnie Cates is doing very well is giving the spotlight to other characters like there's great Iron Man moments in this issue. Thor knocking Null's jaw off is very badass. Uh, It's high octane thriller uh, in the same way that Dark Knight's death metal was. And I think that's fun. It's fun to read right now. Agree. Donny Cates is a big use the whole Buffalo writer, and he does it here um, with a lot of the stuff he's been setting up across all the titles he's been working on and just stuff that goes on with the other characters in the Marvel Universe. Uh, Justin, I appreciate your Buffalo reference and go Bills. <laughs> That's right. I've said use the whole Buffalo Bills. Now, as we've been doing for the past <laughs> two weeks on to week three, let's talk about <clears throat> Future State. Over at DC Comics. Ah. Uh, this is an future interesting state. week because we've got a bunch of number one Future State issues, but we're also getting our first number two with Future State, the next Batman number two. Um, there's also a lot of developing story and some big points that we start to get about what's going on in this future world. Um, as we have been doing, why don't you guys call out the things that you particularly like that you thought were interesting? Pete, let's start with you, and I'll offer up the writing teams as we go through. All right, great. Artists, um, I really like the uh, the next Batman. I think this is this is kind of a fun 
Batman in the future with tech and kind of shit that he's up against. I'm enjoying this. Well, let's talk uh, about that one first, uh, because that is, as mentioned, the first number two of this future state slate. Uh, this is written by John Ridley, Vidi Ayala, Paula Sevenbergen, art by Laura Braga, Aneke, and Rob Haynes. Uh, Pete, what did you like about this one in particular? Well, I just I like where we're kind of picking up here. You know, this feels like a, a Batman book. Uh, kind of in the middle of things, uh, picking uh, picking apart like who's doing what to whom. Uh, we've got some bad guys kind of closing in on Batman, and uh, yeah, I uh, also you know Batman's hurt. Like it's nice to see it's not this um, Batman that has no flaws, you know, or is you know can't can't be hurt with the tech armor that he's got on. So I, I'm uh, I f- it feels like a Batman book. It's a, a, a new kind of take on Batman. So I'm excited about it. I think it's I, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, I I like this a lot. It definitely just the voice is different with uh, Batman throughout here. And uh, it, that's just great to see. Um, and it really feels like it's paying off the promise of future state. Like we're doing new versions of these characters yeah. and let's see. And then the, uh, I also thought we um is it Gotham City Sirens at the end, which plays like like a uh, – the art is almost like Dan Parent, yeah. Archie uh, comics, um, which I thought was really fun and just a different sort of uh, vibe mm-hmm. to the whole thing. Is that uh, – we read a lot of these, so forgive me if I got this wrong, but that's the one with Spoiler and, and Cassandra Kane in jail, and, right? Yes. That was great. Uh, I, I love that. That was one of my favorite things this week. I thought that was really fascinating. That picks up on some of the threads that we've gotten uh, on some of the other books with Spoiler in particular. Uh, and just this idea that the magistrate, whoever the magistrate is, uh, who is running Gotham City now, has thrown good guys and bad guys in jail. Just this zero tolerance policy. I think it was a really fun idea. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I completely buy this, but I'll just throw something out at you that was my impression halfway through reading all these future state books. I almost wish DC had gone for it and said, yeah. this is the DC universe now. This is what we're well, doing. This is what we're yeah. doing going forward. Like, to me, that would be you, too big of a shakeup. It would be huge. I and I understand like, why I, they. I understand why they didn't, but like if you remember back in the day, there was uh, the one year later stuff, I believe after 52, yeah. where there's apocalyptic event, they jump forward a year, and then they kind of like filled in stuff later. The idea of doing that and just jumping forward an insane, unspecified amount of time later, I kind of love that, particularly because well, a lot of what we got this week was the idea that... We're told in week one, Batman is gone, Superman is gone, Wonder Woman is gone. They're not gone. They're just in kind of like different status quos at this point. So instead, it does feel like it feels like the DC universe. Just there are some holes to fill in at this point. I what I what I like about this event is I feel like. They are shaking things up. They're getting uh, different people on different projects, and you're getting new takes on it. And it feels like a fresh take, which is great. Um, I think they're doing it smart. If they do, if things start to do uh, well, maybe it takes over the regular title. I think that's a well. They smart are way to do they are continuing next Batman. I mean, that clearly seems like the one that they're all in on. They have John Ridley on it. That's a big deal. Uh, they're continuing that title and that part of the universe. Um, so to your point, Pete, I think there's a couple of others that are going to roll off of. Uh, before we get two of the weeds here, though, Justin, any other titles that jumped out at you? I'm going to give it up for um, uh, Superman Worlds of War. Yeah, Gladiator Superman. Which, yeah, and I really like this because it takes Superman, uh, to your point you mentioned before about how the the main um, trinity are sort of off the board. Here we get to find out where Superman is, and um, he's on War World, and there's a bunch of bad shit happening there. And uh, I thought... It's, uh, let me just interrupt with the creative team for this one. Uh, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, Brendan Easton, Becky Cloonan, and Michael W. Conrad, Jeremy Adams, art by Mikhail Janine, Valentine Delandro, Gleb Melnikov, and Sia Um. Take it away, Justin. I would, I would, Justin, if I can interrupt you for a moment, I'm really hoping it's going to be like Planet Hulk and Superman comes back and he is so pissed and blows up New York. Um, yeah, that's a solid guess. Um, yeah. I really like the Philip Kennedy Johnson story that kicks it off is so great. 
focusing on Smallville. Perfect. He right. talked about this a little bit when he was on our show a few weeks ago. And uh, just a great sort of retrospective about what Superman yeah. is, what he does. Like, it's, it's so good. Uh, I also really like the Midnighter story in this book. This is great and very key to everything that's going on in Future State, because unless I misinterpreted it, and this is a spoiler here, but we find out the identity of Trojan, the person who's been running Metropolis in Superman's absence, and it is uh, none other than Apollo. Um, yeah. What would you think about that, Pete? You love Apollo and Midnighter. What was, so what was I, your take on this twist? I was very aghast. I clutched my pearls. I wasn't ready for it. Those uh, pearls Becky, look lovely, by the way. You look Thank gorgeous. you. Uh, they, Thank they, you. They really accentuate your neck. Oh, you guys. Beautiful neck. Um, um, Becky Cloonan's writing the crap out of this. This is, uh, I, I really want more of this. This is a very, very uh, cool kind of story that we have here in this book. Uh, I like this quite a bit as well. Um, like you said, there are a bunch of them that are really good. Uh, the, I liked... The, what's up, Pete? I was just going to say the art across the board has been really impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because, for me, like DC seems very like a certain style of art. And I've been really impressed with how they're pushing that out a little bit. They're not as cookie cutter as they normally are. So I'm, I'm really impressed with that. I thought uh, Immortal Wonder Woman was the one that I was really looking forward to. Uh, and art-wise, in particular, I thought it was really gorgeous. Really um, nice art. I, yeah. I like the stories quite a bit. Written by Betty Cloonan, Michael W. Conrad, L.L. McKinney. Art by Jen Bartel and Aletha Martinez. Uh, you had two stories, one about Wonder Woman, kind of like an end-of-time Wonder Woman thing going on, and then another one about Nubia, who is yeah. Wonder Woman's twin sister. I thought this was a really solid book, particularly on the Wonder Woman story, which I was really thought was really fascinating, though I liked uh, Nubia as well. But the other one that I wanted to call out that I was very surprised well, real by... Quick, by real quick, on, yeah, on, the one, on the Wonder Woman yeah. one. Wait, I thought wait, it was wait, a, Justin, wait, 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 before you... Just before you say anything, I thought this was going to be your pick because you were inside the head of Wonder Woman at the start of that, and you love that shit. I love being inside people's heads. Um, yeah, I just I'm still trying to crack my way into that La, La Page dome. You don't um, want none of this. I, I feel like in this story, it's sort of positioning Wonder Woman almost like uh, Superman, um, almost like Jor El on Krypton mm-hmm. in the last days, trying to save it while everyone's like, "Nope, we got to do this other stuff." And I thought that was an interesting sort of blending of uh, Wonder Woman and Superman's uh, uh, origin. The um, the Ghost Batman moment with Wonder Woman was very touching. I thought that was very nice. Yeah. Uh, so good stuff. But the, the other one I wanted to call out was Future State Shazam, number one, uh, written yeah. by Tim Sheridan, art by Great Eduardo art. Pensica. This oh. is the one that really drove home for me what I was saying earlier about feeling like Oh, they just could have done this. Like, this doesn't need to be future state. This could be a thing. Because what we get here is Neron has separated Shazam and Billy Batson. Billy Batson, Oof. this is big spoilers, but Billy Batson has been chained to the Rock of Eternity to lock in some prisoner. We don't find out what it is, but it's very bad. And Shazam is left on his own and basically spiraling out and becoming a merciless killer of villains. Uh, And this just feels like such a clear Shazam idea in a very different way. It's something that's like, you don't need to do this 40, 50 years down the road. This is just a good, dark Shazam idea that I like quite a lot. Yeah, I also really liked uh, Legion. Uh, I I felt like that was... Legion? Legion. yeah, Legion number twelve. Oh, was that not part of the uh, no? We future didn't state for this. No, but great that you're reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, that's um, all good. But uh, I like the end, uh, the reveal in Catwoman. I thought they also had great art, and I liked the last page reveal very much. That was super fun as well. Uh, that was written by Ram V, art by Otto Schmidt, and that is just Catwoman going on a great train robbery in this magistrate-run Gotham City. Super fun. I agree. I really liked the Catwoman one. It, I, it was a good use of genre to really uh, tell an interesting story. And the other one we haven't talked about yet is the Nightwing, which I also thought was cool as well. Uh, a lot of different uh, takes. The, yeah. Written by Andrew Constant, art by Nicola Scott. And this uh, finds Nightwing 
kind of like uh, based is getting fed up with the status quo of Gotham City and decided to make a big move there. I'm more excited for the second issue of this one, I think, than the first issue, but very solid nonetheless. Yeah, just I really I thought all these books um, from Future State this week really had something to to really enjoy in them, and that was exciting. Yeah, I think it. I think what they're trying to do is cool. Um, I, I, it's fun to mix things up. I'm definitely at the point, and I know I'll change my mind in a couple of weeks, but I'm definitely at the point where I'm like, oh, I kind of don't want to go back to whatever the status quo is. Oh wow, this wow. is good. I'm enjoying maybe, it. I'm having a fun time. Maybe there's yeah. no status quo ever. Again, no in the world. Status quo, baby. Uh, let's move on to stock one uh, that I think is a, probably a gimme for Pete. Iron Fist, Heart of the Dragon, number one from Marvel, oh, written by Larry Hama, written by yeah! David Wachter. Uh, Pete, what do you think about this? First off, the Hama writing this book is really fantastic. Uh, touches my heart in all the right ways. Um Hama, who famously writes a ton of G.I. Joe, this makes a lot of sense putting him on this book. And this the issue was just glorious. Really a lot of fun. Uh, some uh, cool characters. I, I, I loved it. Plus, uh, anytime you got Luke Cage and Iron Fist together, I'm, I'm a happy camper. Art's unbelievable. This is just a really cool, badass story, and I want more. I mean, is there any more G.I. Joe type story than this with guys named Iron Fist, Task Master? <laughs> like it's right over the gate. Is, if we're going to get Snow Job in here, I think we have a full set. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is fine. This is uh, Taskmaster stealing a bunch of dragon hearts and uh, messing up the Seven Kingdoms. So Iron Fist has to go after him. Uh, there's a bunch of other Heart things. With... of the dragon. Yes. Uh, Lady Bullseye is in there. Like you mentioned, Luke Cage. It's fun. Yeah, and I will say it did take some fun turns. I liked seeing um, Luke Cage uh, in here, uh, really getting up and doing some fighting here. Um, Yeah, also, you know, Daddy Luke Cage, you know, he starts off so lovable, but he's not scared to throw down. You know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, Justin, let's move on to one of, I believe, your favorites of the week. Rain Like Hammers, number one, from Image Comics, created by Brandon Graham. This is a... I don't even know if it takes place in the future. It's definitely a sci-fi book. Uh, but this is present day. It follows a guy. <laughs> it's present day. Uh, follows a guy who works. He watches TV. He eats. This is and like. And then things go terribly wrong. This is the prequel to Wally, is what this is. This book wow. is gorgeous. But Justin, yes. you go ahead. You talk about it. Uh, I love Brandon Graham's art um, and storytelling. Um, the one of the books that really first turned me on is uh, he was doing um, the art on Turn Profit, on. the image book that um, used to be just like a Rob Liefeld like uh, knife and pouch uh, situation, and then took on this trippy uh, sci-fi uh, space take um, in the in the latter issues, and this sort of feels very much in line with that. This could be a standalone issue. Um, and uh, what's the other book that um, Brandon Graham does? Is it Warhead? Something Warhead. Um, Maybe. Also very good. But this, uh, in the back matter, he talks about this was inspired by him sort of being at home and feeling a little like uh, just in a rut. And, uh, yeah, bro. Yeah. So it's uh, in, in talking about healing manga, uh, a processing comic, and how this sort of is. Yeah, multiple is pr- warheads. Multiple warheads. Um, this comic is a little bit about processing the stuff that he was going through when he was writing it. And I, I love that to be able to take something you're going through and really make it beautiful, uh, a beautiful piece of art out of it is great. Also, it reminds King me a little City. bit. Uh, it's almost like sad idiocracy in a way. Like it's not funny. It's just sort of people sitting, ingesting TV, eating things. Honestly, the things sound pretty good that the guy's eating, but he's just living his they life. They did and sound good. Right. And being a drone and kind of going through it. But gorgeous, gorgeous book. Highly recommend picking it up. The yes, Pete? the art alone is worth it. It's mm. just the way it starts off and like sets this tone and like the paneling of just this kind of like vast thing that he's on. It's really just it's very moving and powerful. There, there's a panel towards the end of the book where the main character is standing outside, finally, the place that he's living in, the sort of the massive tank or whatever it is. 
It's a double page spread, and it's so sad and awesome and just so many things at the same time. It's wonderful to see. Uh, definitely pick up this book. Next up, Rorschach number four. It's like a, it's just like a cruise ship that has like elephant legs on it. Sure. Rorschach number four from DC Comics, written by Tom <laughs> King, art by Jorge Fortis. In this issue, we're getting a bit more of the origin of the kid. And if the anything, kid. this seems to be pivoting to be less about Rorschach and more about the kid, this kind of cowboy character that we uh. met over the course of it. Uh, and here we find a man that she... Muscle man. I mean, it's arguable, I think, but tricked into thinking he was the reincarnated soul of Rorschach after Dr. Manhattan destroyed him. A lot of what we've been dealing with in this title and also here is about conspiracy theories, which I think really gets the theme of what Tom King is doing. Um, Another fantastic issue. I don't know what the thrust of this title is, and I don't think we will know until the last issue, but man, every issue individually is so impeccably done. I, yeah, if... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. I was just going to say, if Tom King wasn't a good writer, I'd be so pissed, because I have no fucking idea what is happening, but I'm still having a great time. And part of me is like, maybe Muscle Man was. I mean, how do we know? I think that's part of the, the take here, and what I... What my I really love reading this series and really love sort of thinking about it after I finish each issue. And with this one, it feels like Tom King is taking some of the the Rorschach stuff that's happened since since Watchmen ended, where Rorschach is sort of being put in as like, oh, he was a precursor to a lot of the way people are feeling now politically, like isolated, believing conspiracy theories and just chasing them up, all that kind of stuff. And so to take that sort of um, version of Rorschach and then remix it again for our age where she makes this guy believe that he is Rorschach, believes this sort of fake news, this conspiracy stuff, and then he acts on it. I mean, it feels so prescient given um, the politics that have been happening in the last couple of weeks with the January 6th insurrection and all that. This feels like it's all like uh, speaking to these same issues. And to be able to write something that feels that topical when it comes out is amazing to me. Pete? I, yeah, I just think that like <laughs> uh, I I kind of said how I feel about it as far as like uh it's it's impressive but it's also confusing but like the uh, the way that the kid is portrayed is very very interesting um and i i think it's really great kind of personification of somebody in this way but also as i was like kind of reading it i wrote down in my notes i think i'm crazier now after i've read this book yeah you're next. I mean, the kid is like a charismatic sociopath who believes in this stuff and convinces other people to believe in it. And, and it's funny, too, because there's a line in it where it's like, uh, well, what's the kid's name? And it's like, I don't know. We call him the kid. And I have a friend like that where um, if they knew that I didn't know his actual name, we just call him the kid. He'd be pretty upset. I will say, and I don't know if I can completely believe this premise, but I do feel like there's a certain hesitance on King's part to touch Watchmen. And I say that fully knowing there is a scene in here that shows the characters in Watchmen interacting in a new way, but there's something about it that feels like you have a book called Rorschach. You're not actually focusing on Rorschach. What exactly is going or on Or is it all about Rorschach? See, I disagree. I think what, what this book does, it takes the ideas of Rorschach and really looks at, puts them on the table and looks at them with a modern eye in a way that I really, I think, I think gets deeper or, than just having Rorschach like, be like, hey, what's up? Uh, hey, what's up, blue guy? Classic Rorschach line. Yeah. What's yeah. up, dudes? <laughs> what's up? It's me, the Rorschachies. Hang I think ten. it is. It's a very You're not much hanging like an, ten in here with me. I'm hanging ten in here with you. Oh, buddies. That's good. Buddies. Uh yeah, I just think it's like a classic ink blot scenario. We're all bringing our own things to the story and it's just reflecting our own bullshit, you know. I don't know how that uh, connects in any way to what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. What is that in relation to? What are, yeah, what are you even talking about, Pete? Uh, are you trying to test Abbott, us? Have <laughs> it nineteen seventy three to Abbott. Abbott. 
1973, number one from Boob Studios, written by Solid Dead on Bed, art by Semi uh, Cavella. Uh, this is Pick It Up, of course, on previous series of Abbott. Uh, she is a investigator. She's got some supernatural powers. <sighs> Um, I, I feel like I've only read one or two issues of Abbott, but this was a good jumping on point anyway. And I felt like as a pulpy 1970s supernaturally inflected mystery, it was very enjoyable to read. Yeah, I agree. Abbott! Yeah, Abbott, I agree. The, um, I mean, we don't get much of the supernatural side of it, just little gestures to it until the um, very end. But I really love the table setting in this issue and the sort of – just the vibe. It's got a good sort of irreverent vibe uh, throughout. <clears throat> hey, I bet. Yeah, I think that uh, first off, uh, give a nod to – this is the year his album was born, so I just want to give a shout-out to that there. <laughs> not true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm just messing with you. He loves telling you lies born, about Pete? us. That's been his bit yeah. for the, quite some time. Pete was born yeah, in 1942. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Sail the Ocean Blue. Um, but I, what I do, uh, what's nice is it's an interesting way to deal with this kind of like that creepy feeling of someone like, I like the reveal at the end and it kind of made sense with the things that happened. It's one of those things where you're like, you read it and you're like, Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, it, I, I'm enjoying it. I, it's weird, but I like it. Let's move on and talk about Black Cat, King in Black, number two from Marvel, written by Jen McKay, art by C.F. Villa. Of course, we had Jen McKay on our live show this week, so definitely go we did? listen to that. We did, Pete. Uh, you were there oh, and everything. I it. So Black uh, Cat has been it. tasked with stealing Doctor Strange from uh, Null, the King in Black. We get to see that heist this issue. Uh, this is so much fun. So much fun. I, I've said this. I said this a lot on the on the live show. Like, I love this book. This book is so smartly done. We It's rare for me to see a character where she has multiple sides. So many superhero characters are. It's like they do their one thing and we just see it a bunch of different ways. And But the Black Cat really gets to be different things to different people. She gets to feel things, be very serious, be a little bit more lighthearted. And then just the heist of it all is just so well done. Uh, the... Throwing on an anti-venom suit to dive into the goop is such a smart idea, and it's it's dramatic, it's tense. There's some spider uh, mobile stuff. It's great. Really pl- plugging the hell out of goop on this show. Um, yeah, I really. Uh, there's also a lot of fun nerd stuff in here, like you know the fact that she gets to fly on the uh, goblin glider, you know, and then the. Uh, spider buggy later. I mean, this is just, they're having a lot of fun with this character, which is great to see. I love the baby Bjorn with the ghost dog. I mean, this is just good shit. And uh, it's cool to kind of see this. I'm very much, I'm not a huge black cat fan, but I'm having a lot of fun. You love cats. It's true. It's a good point. Speaking of which, let's move on and talk about Batman Catwoman number two from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Clay Mann. In this issue, we're jumping through multiple timelines here. Um, We're getting to see Batman and Catwoman do some stuff where they're tracking down the Phantasm, I believe, who is killing uh, the henchman of the Joker. In the future timeline, Catwoman has come to kill the old Joker, and maybe there's another timeline in there. I gotta be honest with you. Clayman's art, gorgeous. Tom King's right, yes. good. I like reading this book. I am having a very hard time following what is happening in these issues. Wow. Well, it's only the second issue. So, um, because I do sort of agree with you, it's hard to connect the uh, the plots um, as it's going. You no, know, it's too early yet. Don't try to do this. This is Tom King, guys. Just let's lay off a little bit. Enjoy the, the ride. The thing is, like, there's not, there's not enough of an artistic or textual indicator for the timelines right now where I understand part of the idea is that all of this is mashed together. It's all happening at the same time. It all connects to each other. But just from a reader perspective... There are some pages where it's jumping between three timelines, and it takes me a second to or two to realize, oh, okay, this is taking place in the middle timeline. This is taking place in the first timeline, and that takes me out of the story a little bit. 
Well, a second or two, you don't have that kind of time to spare. I yeah, know, I you were born say, in 1973. Easy, I, <laughs> yeah, easy speed reader. You don't have to just like plow through everything. You know, sometimes you got to stop and think about what's happening. I was a, a child of the love generation, man. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Conceived uh, at Woodstock, uh, <laughs> born in the back of the Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young men. Uh, Zalbin, with all due respect, I disagree. I'm having a lot of fun on this book because I miss that cat, uh, Catwoman, Batman relationship. This is and a this, bizarre mirror world that we're in, but go ahead, Pete. Yes. And so um, also I thought it was touching the way uh, Joker wished Catwoman a, a Merry Christmas. I thought that was very nice. Um <laughs> But yeah, we're getting a lot of different <laughs> worlds and different timelines mashed up. We're even getting an old villain from Batman the Animated Series. Um, but Tom King does an amazing job on, on Batman, and I'm going to let this breathe a little bit before I start getting to what timeline are we in. I'm just enjoying the ride and the artwork, and it, man, is it great. Clay, man, is it great. Um, I do think part of it was, I think this book was, the expectations for this book were fun romance between Batman and Catwoman. And it's just not that. It's like a whole no. new storyline. No, but and, they're dealing with stuff, though. You, you can they tell uh, of with course. a little back and forth. Of course. Uh, I think they are. Um, what? <laughs> Well, you make it, you know, it's not always sunny uh, beaches. And, I, I'm not you know, saying. You know what I mean? Sometimes relationships get real. You got to have tough conversations, man. Uh, I've never had a difficult conversation with anyone. That's <laughs> oh, all smooth sailing for old JT. Uh, no, yep. my point is you're walking into this book and it's just a different, it's a whole different thing. You're the multiple timelines. There actually is very little romance in this. It's, it's about yep. the Joker um, pretty exclusively so far and the introduction of the, the phantasm. But what I do think now, is amazing about this, it feels like Tom King is really writing toward clay man. Every panel in this book feels like it's so specific. It's so curated and it is just something to behold. Even the small panels are just perfect. There's this section where the jo- it's a close up on the Joker um, with a candy cane. Like it's everything is yeah. so deliberate and I think it's great. Now uh, I don't know about you guys, but like, you know, uh, the part where the the subway scene and, and you know getting a little spoilers, uh, someone dies in the subway, and I was like, oh man, that is the worst. You finally get a subway car all to yourself, and someone murders you. Oh mm. man, classic New York, classic yeah. New York. You sound almost nostalgic for it, Pete. But I actually don't yeah. think you live. You're not a New Yorker anymore, so you get that name out of your mouth. <laughs> the Scumbag, speaking of Pete, number four, <laughs> two is comics, written by Rick Remender, art by Eric Powell. Uh, in this issue, our main scumbag is heading on a discreet mission to a eyes wide shut style orgy that is going on. Things go predictably wrong. Uh, we had Rick Remender on the show last week where he talked about this title. Um, so it was fun to get his input. But what do you think about this issue? Yeah, this is just uh, insanity, uh, but I do like how everybody's skeeved out uh, by the scumbag, and uh, you know that that's kind of funny how he can't get himself into the one place he wants to be. Um, but yeah, this continues to be amazing storytelling, fantastic art, a creepy ass fucking dude that I don't know why we're rooting for, but we are, and just kind of like uh, this. Scenario keeps getting more and more intense. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the Pete bag is sort of one of Remender's uh, real uh, good, uh, another great book from him. The art is fantastic, and the way that he is just, you could tell he's having such a great time writing the scumbag um, for who he is. And I think Rick Remender with this and another book we may be talking about very soon, Seven to Eternity, it's really playing with, like, why does the protagonist have to be the be good? And why is the villain bad? Like, maybe we can mix those. And I think he just does that really well. And same thing here. Like, this guy's a scumbag, but we still root for him. But he does a bunch of bad stuff. But he seems inherently good. And the bad guys seem like they're just trying to do what everyone's do- doing, getting by as best they can. It's it's interesting storytelling. Once a Future, number 15 from Boob Studios, written by Kira uh, Gillen. Sorry, Justin. In this, sorry, Justin? 
Yeah, he was he was clearly teeing up seven to an eternity, but you were like, fuck that. We're going once in future. So I sent out a list. <laughs> oh, here we go. Behind the scenes. You can't stray from the list. If something comes up organically, we got to stick to the list. You're at, looking back, I don't think we should have given Pete that much power at the beginning to have his little what's up corner. Because I think he's yeah. it's really gone to his head. Yeah, I think the vodka is what's going You to wanted to talk about what's in future, I'm sure, Pete, because yes, the grandma is in this a lot. Uh, in this issue, we find out about uh, Lancelot. Uh, we also find out more about the backstory of what was going on. Uh, great issue. Fun as always. High octane drama and action with some terrifying things going on. As usual, just another good issue of What's in Future. Good is an understatement, man. This is great. The art's unbelievable. The action is over the top. This continues to be one of the must pickups uh, of the week. It, the, every time there's an issue of Once in Future, it just continues to be phenomenal. The grandma keeps getting more and more badass. And we get to kind of see the other half, the why we're kind of in this mess in this issue. And I also really love the you, I'm going to tell you a story, you're going to tell me a story moment. And like uh, that first story is fucking really powerful, especially when you sh- reveal scars. Yeah. Um, I do. Th- I like that we're getting to really learn the rules of this uh, comic as it's going on, and this issue especially, yeah. where it, it's a story about stories. Uh, but in this, it's about sort of who's taking power and uh, who's the storyteller, and which story are they telling? It feels like that's the hat that everyone ke- continues to pass over. Like, wait, who are you? Who are you in this story? Oh, I'm this. I started telling this story. Like, I think that's that refreshes that sort of trope of a story about stories in a in a fun way. And the art is fantastic. Um, Lancelot screaming in French. I mean, I'm here for it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Let's move on. Talk about Maestro War and Pax. Number one from Marvel, written by Peter David, art by Javier Pina. Uh, this is picking up on the first Maestro miniseries here. The Hulk finally fully is the Maestro, but he hasn't consolidated all of his power as of yet. Uh, so he's going past the remnants of the Marvel Universe. Uh, I think we talked about the first issue of the Maestro miniseries previously, yep. so I thought it was worth checking in with this one. How do you think it's holding up? Well, it's kind of upsetting to see kind of like a evil Hulk. Um, so it, it really? you know, it, yeah, you know, it's uh, usually I'm on the green guy's side. So this is it's a little tough to see uh, how this guy goes about business. Wow, heartbreaker. Um, I I like this a lot. I really like seeing the Pantheon um, from Peter David's run way back in the day. Characters that no one else has really touched uh, since, and um, I like them. I also like that um, the Hulk and his, uh, the Maestro and his squad just jump on the Staten Island Ferry and uh, drive mm-hmm. down to D.C. Yeah. to go confront them, uh, which is just a fun visual choice. And uh, it's great to see that the Maestro sort of messes up. Um, you expect him to just dominate, and it's about him sort of not doing so hot. Yeah, I mean, Peter David is a master of the comic book form. Just everything is perfectly paced out. His jokes work. Everything works. Uh, The action works. It's always a joy to read one of his books because they're just they're firing on all cylinders every single time, even decades into his career at this point. And it's great. Uh, let's move on and talk about Stillwater number five from Image Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky and art by Roma and K. Perez. Here he's we're... really, he's really going to make you wait, Justin. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I'm not. I'm fine. I wasn't digging. Oh up. my god! I mean, for those of you listening <laughs> to the podcast, Justin is furious right now. Yeah, um, yeah. You can see it's it just like boiling. flames. Coming out of his head. Yeah. Uh, Still Water number five from Image Comics. Uh, this is a big issue here as our main character has taken residence in Stillwater, the town where nobody dies. Everybody has taken this as an opportunity to let the judge, the guy who rules the town, uh, know that, hey, they want to change things. They want to leave. They want to let the outside world know about stuff. Things go terribly wrong, and then they get more wrong from there. Uh, man, even though we're five issues in, it feels like 
this is whipping through story at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I love, I, I think it's really mm-hmm. coming into its own. Um, the, uh, it's starting to remind me a little bit of uh, Southern Bastards. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's fair. Um, and I think the the judge has some Coach Boss vibe to him, and I just yeah. think the energy has that. Southern Bastards, a great book by Jason Aaron and Jason Latour from years ago that I sort of think was left open ended that I just wish we could see more of. Um, but this is fun. It, it really is like I don't know what's going to happen. It feels like bad stuff is happening all around um, in this town that lives yeah. forever. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that at the at this town there's a kind of a power hungry uh, uh, judge who's not willing to hear the people. Um, I I think that this it book continues to with the twists and turns. We're kind of finally getting everything all out on the on the page here in this issue, so we kind of know where everybody stands and what the kind of moving forward is going to look like. But man. I, even with all that, the kind of twists and turns that happen in this comic were still pretty powerful and and pretty crazy. Yeah. Last and definitely least. Oh, oh sorry, no, Justin. Seven to Eternity, number 16, from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender, art by Jerome Opeña. Uh, this is the second to last, I believe, issue of this title, as we talked to Rick Remender about. Uh, here, we're starting to wrap things up in an enormous battle way. Uh, This feels to me, I mean, they're obviously very different stories, but it feels to me very much like the end of Low, where we're just getting these insane, over-the-top battle scenes with all of our characters as he starts to wrap things up. Um, But it's great. I mean, in particular, Jerome Opeña's art is stunning on every page of this issue. And he's managed I mean, to tell a story, like, following up on what I was saying, like, honestly, so long ago. But, um, like, to flip the hero and the villain here uh, in, in a, <laughs> and, and still surprise us. And at the same time, telling, like, an epic Avengers or Justice League style, like, cosmic uh, stakes battle uh, with all original characters. Like, it's, um, it's just really excellent comic making. Yeah, I mean, I can't stop paging through the art. I mean, the splash pages with the kind of like waterfall, fallen giants thing is just, it's really unbelievable. The the monsters, the it's just really, really impressive. Um, yeah, the twists that happen. Man, what a great book. I cannot wait to see how this wraps up. This is really, really great comic book uh, right here where we get to read. Well, and I'll tell you how the stack is going to wrap up. It's going to wrap up right now. If you'd like to support us, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out. We'd love to chat with you about comic books. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the show at comic book live on Twitter comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and more. Until next time, we'll see you at the Digital Comic Book Shop. What's up? Justin, <laughs> 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 <laughs>